For this episode of Bad Reviews, I'm going to be talking about something I don't usually touch on that much, the production end, that is, the nuts and bolts business of making a movie. It's something that's usually not considered within the purview of the creative aspect of filmmaking, but the two are often very intertwined, especially within the world of independent filmmaking. When you're an independent movie producer, what that role means in a concrete sense is that you're the boss. While the director oversees the movie as a creative endeavor, the producer oversees it as a work project. The producer needs to allocate money, hire the cast and crew, schedule film shoots, find and secure locations for filming, all the basic groundwork that allows the director and the actors to do their thing. In independent films, especially bad ones, the director and producer are often the same person. Sometimes you get lucky, and the result is uh, Citizen Kane, where the art and business sides of movie making work together in unison to achieve a singular vision. Most of the time, though, the result of a producer directing his own movie is a director with no accountability. The Room, Ben and Arthur, Birdemic, uh, Food Fight, Movie 43, North, Geely, all of them were directed and produced by the same person, as are all of Uwe Boll's films and the worst films of Seltzer and Friedberg. But this week, we're taking a look at a movie that, despite its significant creative failures, is something of a role model for low-budget movie production, and in an alternate universe might even have been a classic horror movie. Tonight, Bad Reviews goes behind the scenes of Manos, The Hands of Fate. My name is Daniel Steckley, and my obsession is failure. I believe that the secrets to success lie in understanding the mistakes of the past. I'm on a mission to investigate the greatest flops, bombs, and busts in every form of media. From movies to television, music to video games, anime and comics too, the things I review are diverse, but they all have one thing in common. They've all had some very, very bad reviews. Let me take you back in time to 1966. Independent movie making doesn't really exist in the national consciousness the way it does today and the opportunity to fool around with movie making doesn't exist the way it does today. Sundance is still 12 years off, the blockbuster success of Night of the Living Dead is still two years away, and Super 8 film had only been introduced the year before, and even then, shooting feature-length professional films in 8mm was never really a thing. Against this backdrop, we have El Paso, Texas, and the classic American TV series Route 66. The concept for the show was that the characters drove from town to town, and the show would actually film on location in those towns. And for one episode, the town in question was El Paso, Texas. While filming there, local actor Hal P. Warren, who had a walk-on on the show, met the show's writer, a man actually named Sterling Siliphant. Warren, convinced that it wouldn't really be that hard to make a movie, bet Siliphant that he could make a horror movie all on his own. He wasn't wrong... Manos, thou of primal darkness, thou who dwellest in the depth of the universe in the black chasms of night. Manos, The Hands of Fate was the result, one of the most staggeringly amateurish movies ever made, and honestly that's just about the worst thing you can say about it, that it's amateurish. Like, I'm also a bit of an amateur filmmaker, and watching Manos, I was struck by just how many rookie mistakes I recognize, mistakes that I've made and continue to make for that matter. But even though Hal Warren is the writer, the director, the producer, and the star of the movie, there's no trace of the ego you'd normally expect from such a setup. In fact, especially considering that Hal Warren's show business experience was as an actor, you'd expect the movie to be way more self-indulgent than it is. And that's probably because Manos has no artistic ambitions, or perhaps more accurately, its artistic ambition is simply to exist. As Jackie Jones, the child actress in the movie, put it to Cracked.com, You have to understand that Hal's quite the salesman, so they jumped at this opportunity. And Hal never pushed it as a great movie. He said from the beginning that he was making a B-movie, but he thought it was going to open the doors for future film products, so everyone stuck it out, hoping it would lead to something better. None of the cast or crew were actually paid. Warren simply promised them percentages of the film's profits. And as one of the actors in the film recalled, then we come to find out about I don't know, six, five weeks, three weeks into the thing, we're having a party one night. We said, by the way, uh, what percentage is you? Do you have the thing? Well, what's your percentage? Well, what's your percentage? Well, we got 150 percent real quick, and we knew that there were lots of other people who put real money into it. 
I think it should go without saying that there were no profits. The movie ran once at a theater in El Paso and a couple times at drive-ins in Texas, presumably out of pity. This is a clip from Hotel Torgo, a short-form documentary made in 2004 about the making of the film. This and Jackie Jones' Cracked article are the only publicly accessible information about the making of the film. Jackie Jones also wrote a book about it, but it's still in the mail, so hopefully there's nothing really important in it. The picture that they paint is of a movie that, while creatively incompetent, had an unusually savvy production, especially for a first-time effort. Manos is a very dark movie, and I don't mean that thematically, though, yeah, yeah, but yeah, but visually, visually, it is very dark. It is hard to see much of the movie, and that's because they shot most of it at night, because the cast and crew all had day jobs, and the movie works around this by being set almost entirely over the course of a single night. Everybody was always into it until about 10 o'clock. And then it got a little old, and then by one o'clock it got real, it got real old, it got real old. The movie also takes place almost entirely at one location, with various places around the location used to keep the shots from getting too tedious. There's also only one effects shot in the whole movie, if you don't count the failed effect that is Torgo's legs. Bad low-budget movies like Birdemic, Troll 2, Ben and Arthur, and Plan 9 are characterized by a reach that exceeds their grasp. They want to have special effects and action and locations that they just can't accomplish. Manos, on the other hand, is very aware of its limitations and smartly works around them. Even though Hal Warren was a completely amateur director and a not very good actor, he seems to have had a natural knack for the production side of filmmaking. Even though he was creatively out of his depth, he seemed to know exactly what he was doing as far as the money went. Most Zed movies like this are completely bereft of people with any kind of future in filmmaking, but I honestly think that Hal Warren could have been a capable TV show producer. It is a testament, though, to the absolute lack of experience of everyone involved, that even though the production works its hardest to conceal the movie's limitations, that it is still staggeringly bad. Everything about the production was working to conceal the crew's weakness, and they still turn in something that's a couple steps up from a home movie. The cinematography is basically non-existent. It is fascinating to watch something shot on film, 1960s film, that has no sense of shot composition whatsoever. The blocking is simplistic and not framed well, and it goes beyond not setting up visually interesting shots. A lot of the time the actors' heads are cropped off the top of the frame. And the editing, the editing I especially want to talk about. See, the thing about Manos is that it is a very short film. Like, at 70 minutes, it barely squeaks in at feature length. And boy, does it feel like a movie that barely squeaks in at feature length. Somewhere between 10 and 20% of this movie's runtime is padding. And it's padding that was clearly introduced in editing. This, I believe, is the most amateurish mistake the movie makes. The script clearly wasn't long enough for an actual feature-length film, and the edit mangles the footage into something that can hit the 70-minute mark. It is very obvious that they didn't realize the movie wasn't going to be long enough until they were already in the editing room. Manos is full of these awkward pauses, where the actors just sort of stare at each other, not saying anything, before something happens. Now, I can't verify this, but I'm pretty sure that what's happening here is that the editor decided to pad out the runtime by using the dead air footage between when the camera rolled and when the actors actually start acting. The movie is also full of weird jump cuts, because the cameras they were shooting on were only capable of shooting for 30 seconds at a time, and this is a problem in an era where long shots are the norm. This is the one element of technical weakness that Manos does a bad job of working around. The editing absolutely annihilates the film. Manos, as it exists, is a terrible film, one of the worst of all time, but if it had been edited competently, then maybe it wouldn't have been such a catastrophe. And so the editing arguably saves the movie in terms of its entertainment value. I cannot overstate how awkward Manos is. There is so much staring, and the edit just lets it linger for so long. And it doesn't help that, well, there's Torgo. I am Torgo. 
I take care of the place while the master is away. Torgo is the most famous part of Manos, and for good reason. I can't decide if it's the best performance in the movie or the worst. The actor, John Reynolds, is very, very obviously inebriated in all of his scenes. He was an incredible actor, a really good actor. Um, had problems, had some really serious problems. Uh, Jackie Jones, who played the little girl in the movie, remembered him as being all kinds of fun on the set, and in later years realized it was probably because he was high on something all the time. Torgo was famously supposed to be a satyr in the script, but Reynolds wore the leg riggings backwards, so it just made him look like a guy with really, really odd legs. Reynolds also, less amusingly, committed suicide before the movie was released. Torgo drives the plot of Manos. He's the groundskeeper or something for The Master, who's supposed to be the head of a cult, but is basically just a Satanist with a harem and a henchman. When a young family arrives at their compound, the cult's standard practice would be to kill the husband and abduct the wife into the harem, but the presence of a child complicates this, and Torgo decides that he wants the wife for himself. These sound like interesting complications. Solid hooks for a white people in peril plot. The only problem is that they're resolved in the most obvious, uncomplicated way, which also results in the movie's ending being very, very dark. The conflict between Torgo and the Master just results in the Master killing Torgo and replacing him with the father, and the little girl just gets added to the harem, so nothing interesting comes of that conflict. Horrific, but not really interesting. I, I don't know if I'm doing a good job of articulating it, but the reason why Manos isn't super compelling is because it presents stakes, like it presents the possibility that something will happen, and then those things just happen. Now. I can't say with certainty that any aspect of the Master's cult was modeled on polygamous Mormon sects, but given that the film was made in Texas, it's certainly possible that stories about Mormon groups were in the back of Warren's mind when he wrote the script. This is the only really interesting analytical thing about the movie, beyond its general disregard for women. Yeah, the villain might be an abusive polygamist, but Fury Road this ain't. Half of the father's dialogue is chewing out his wife. In other words, it's a movie made by Texans in 1966. Oh man, I liked D-Stax better before he became an SJW. This is from the first episode of Bad Reviews, dumbass. Hobbies, frolicking through the fields, shopping at Quickville Mall, and cooking. Nothing sexist about that. So, if you were hoping for, like, a long-winded discussion of the secret meaning of Manos or its cultural background, sorry. There's not really much to talk about. Manos lacks the ambition to be anything more than a B-movie, and there's nothing to say about the vast majority of B-movies. Manos fits in more with the modern world of Asylum Mockbusters than it does with the nascent independent movie scene of the 1960s. It's not a movie that Hal Warren made to express some kind of personal truth, it's a movie purely as a business venture. Like, that was the idea of B-movies, especially in the 50s and the 60s and continuing into the exploitation boom of the 70s. It was to make a movie as cheaply as you possibly could so that even the poorest performance still netted you a profit, and you can still see it today with the post-paranormal activity found footage boom. When Hollywood studios see a way to make movies cheaply that people will still pay to see, they jump on that shit because there's so few sure things in movie making. And you can still find interesting things to say about movies made totally commercially. You can see the cultural background, the assumptions that go into them. But Manos just happens to be pretty creatively sparse. It isn't emblematic of any kind of social trend of the 60s. It doesn't reveal anything interesting about middle-class white people in El Paso, Texas in the 60s. It just doesn't happen to be a very interesting movie outside the fact of its creation. You have failed us, Torgo. For this you must die. Manos, however, failed to make back even its minuscule budget of $19,000, which in today's money is $139,000, which in terms of raising money for a guy's pet project is insanely successful, but in terms of making a movie, well, it's pocket change. The Room cost 43 times that to make. The Room. 
However, it only cost about half of what it cost to make The Evil Dead, and I feel like that's the most comparable movie. That's the best case scenario for Manos. I think it's possible that there's some parallel universe out there where, by the roll of the dice, the script happened to be better, Warren happened to be a better director, and the edit didn't mangle the footage. There's the seeds of an interesting story in Manos, and the twist ending is legitimately pretty effective if you don't see it coming. I don't think it's hard to imagine a world where Manos is remembered as a cult classic for good reasons instead of bad ones. Independent filmmaking and horror have gone together since, well, around the time of Manos. Two years later, George Romero would make Night of the Living Dead and essentially invent the zombie. Horror naturally lends itself to lower budget filmmaking, to a grittier, less polished aesthetic. You'll even find people who argue that horror is more effective if the effects are a little shitty, a little dingy, because polish makes you feel safe. A dingy, unpolished movie never lets you have the assurance that you won't see something truly awful. If Warren had gotten an actually competent writer to write the script, or if he'd gone through the studio system instead of insisting on doing it on his own, I really think that this movie is definitely salvageable. But then it wouldn't really be Manos. The point of making the movie in the first place was to make a movie totally independently. So maybe there isn't a scenario where Manos comes out a diamond in the rough, because the purpose of its creation makes that impossible. It doesn't matter if professional help could save the movie, if the whole point of making the movie was for Hal Warren to thumb his nose at the concept of professional filmmaking. If Warren's ego doesn't show through in his performance or in the script, it shows through in the very existence of the film. He really thought that just anyone can make a movie. And in a way, though not the way he had hoped, he was right. And I'm here as a testament to that. This November will mark the 50th anniversary of Manos the Hands of Fate, and we're living in Hal Warren's world. Anyone can make a movie. You're looking right now at Dirk Dangerous, a 12-minute movie that I made as a school project. It's even worse than Manos is. But it also didn't cost me 139 grand to make. It didn't cost me anything. And the setup I'm using now is still pennies compared to the even tiny amount that Warren raised. Uh, the computer and the monitor, the whole setup for the just the computer and with the upgraded video card I put in earlier this year, it came out that totals to about $1,300. Uh, the camera I'm recording this video on is about $180 if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, this microphone set me back about $400 but was worth every penny. Very... I, very good microphone. Uh, and my subscription to Adobe Creative Cloud is about $70 a year, but even all that added up barely works out to about $2,000 total. An entire feature-length movie, Tangerine, was shot on iPhones. Now, that having been said, the filmmakers were experienced professionals who didn't just open up the camera app and have at it. And that's the thing. The reason why Manos isn't good and was never going to be good. Just because you can do something, doesn't mean you can do it well. Because The Evil Dead wasn't Sam Raimi's first movie, and Night of the Living Dead wasn't the first time George Romero picked up a camera. Being good at something is a matter of talent honed by practice, and nobody involved in Manos had either. Manos doesn't even feel like a movie when you watch it. It feels like a movie within a movie about a bunch of clueless schmucks trying to make a movie. Like, it feels like the product of a Christopher Guest film. Something between Waiting for Guffman and For Your Consideration. And now I just can't get over how much better Manos would be if Eugene Levy had been playing the father. Manos The Hands of Fate stands as a monument to sheer unwarranted gumption. It is an embodiment of the triumph and the folly of human endeavor. So maybe it's more like a 2000s Will Ferrell comedy, the missing third chapter in his Unreasonably Confident Men trilogy. Hal Warren was a dumbass who thought he could do something that he objectively could not, but damn it, he made a motherfucking movie, and that's more than I've ever done. Manos rings in on the Suckville scale as our very first three. It is not a very funny bad movie, it's mostly just really, really bad. This is where its lack of ambition hurts it. Hal Warren set out to make a not very good movie, and he made a very, very not good movie. Watch it with friends who you can riff on it with, or even better, just watch the MST3K episode. 
And also, if you want to support the survival of bad movies, Manos got a Blu-ray release last year when somebody found an old version of the film that's much, much higher quality than the copy of a copy of a copy that most people have seen. So, until next time, when we're going to be taking a look at... Oh. Oh god, no. I'd like to take a moment to thank by name Adam Ali, Ian Wright, and Lyle Groniger for being such generous Patreon backers. If you'd like your name read aloud at the end of the show or featured in the credits, consider backing bad reviews at www.patreon.com slash dstacks. And to those who are already backing me, thank you all for your support. You don't know what you're saying you've not been told I don't think it's because you're growing cold But maybe So the rest of the people are working on this thing really, really hard. And he worked that hard. I thought the guy was going to have a heart attack. I really did. We figured he could have either an aneurysm or just an upfront stroke. <laughs>